oh, I guess we're just robots or puppets then. Oh, yes. I remember sitting with Gordon Clark and I gave him that objection. I said, well, it just mean we're puppets. He said, no, that's too high a view of man. The puppet view is too high a view. If you look at Romans 9, we are only lumps of ordinary <laughs> clay. Bringing it down. God is the potter, we are the clay. Arminians assume we are the potter, God is the clay. We can make God into whatever we want to make him. God is like a very pliable thing. So they say, well, I can't believe in a God who would throw people in an eternal hell. And they're there on the wheel, shaping a God after their own image, a God that they will uh, accept and allow to live in their sin. And so they want to recreate God according to what they think or they feel or they want him right. to be. Where scripture says, don't think that I'm at all like you. I'm not you. You're not me. My thoughts are not your thought. My ways are not your way. So yes, we must understand that most free willers would use the puppet idea, which is too advanced, too sophisticated, and little strings and springs. And, and Gordon Clark was right. Get it to the biblical. You want to talk about it as a metaphor? God is the potter. We are the clay. And of the same lump of clay, he takes half of it and makes mm -hmm. a urinal or a bedpan. And the other half he makes into a beautiful vase. And then when you say, by what right does God make vessels of wrath and it's vessels of fair, mercy? After all. It's not fair. Uh, Paul rebukes you and says, who in the world are you? Right. You're nothing but a clay. Can you imagine you have a lump of clay and it's spinning around and the clay says, you have no right to make me whatever you want to make. Of course he does. He's the potter. God has a right to do what he wants to do according to his plan. So Paul says, as a rebuke, who are you to question what God does in his sovereignty? Mm -hmm. I think people have a wrong definition, as with many other words, but to include the word fair and think it means equalness. Well, God yeah, is not yeah, a... yeah. They're like children. I mean, as your, as your child grows, one of the things you will hear, let's say um, you have three children, and the youngest looks and sees that the oldest got a whole hamburger, mm -hmm. and he only got a half of a hamburger. But you're looking at his size. That's all he can handle. He can eat a half a hamburger. He can eat a whole hamburger. Immediately, it's not there. <laughs> well, no. You cannot treat all your children equally because there are distinctions of age and maturity. So if you have a 16-year-old and you let him have the keys to the car and he now has a driver's permit and you go out driving, the 12-year-old kid could say, well, then I can drive too because it's <laughs> not fair. We have to be equal. No. We're not all born equally alike. Some are born, thank goodness, in terms of their IQ, slightly above that of a snail. <laughs> There's a 20 watt bulb IQ, a 40 watt, a 60 watt. We're not all born with the same athletic ability. Uh, by the way, this impinges upon William Lane Craig and J.P. Moreland's book Toward a Christian Worldview, which never uses any scripture. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how you can have a Christian view without the Bible. It's a, it's a, it's a noble attempt. No mentions of any But see, they, they, they admit that they're taking this humanistic concept of human nature uh, from Greek philosophy. They're honest men to admit it's a pagan concept. And they recognize that the idea that every human being has this innate ability of free will, how does that work with kids with brain damage, retarded children? How does that work with someone in a car accident had damage to the brain? How does it work for drug addicts? In other words, as they look around them, the nice theory that everybody has the same ability, let them to say this, which is a very way, very insensitive to the, the handicap. Everybody has these perfect innate abilities, but some people choose not to exercise them.
it's nice to say everybody has these perfect abilities which they got from Greek philosopher, uh, the Stoics and whatnot. But the cruel reality, we're not all born equally the same. Well, speaking of uh, different categories of people who have lesser bases of knowledge, uh, let's say concerning the gospel, what would you say about the heathen? Because uh, well, I, I do deal with the heathen question, uh, particularly in my book *Death in the Afterlife*, and mm -hmm. then in another book, because this is really how you test whether or not the theologian is a biblical theologian. Mm -hmm. A biblical theologian, when he's asked, what about the heathen? What about the heathen? Will go to what? The Bible. Paul said those without the knowledge of the Torah mm -hmm. will perish without it. Those without the law will perish without it. Those who have the law but don't obey it will likewise perish. Either way, those with the knowledge of Scripture will still perish. Those with the knowledge but they don't obey it will perish. Scripture is very clear that the heathen shall be turned into hell, Psalm 15. So when you exegete the issue, it is very clear only those who repent and believe will be allowed into God's presence through the merits of Christ. The idea that uh, Aristotle was saved, mm -hmm. uh, Socrates was saved, the larger hope view, the Roman Catholic view, which is now taught at places like Westminster Seminary and elsewhere, Michael Horton, it's all documented. Uh, you can hand me that book here. I document you have people who even claim to be Reformed theologians who now teach the Roman Catholic view that if people live up to natural law, that they're going to get into heaven regardless of what they believe and how they live. And Michael Horton goes so far as to say, even if what they believe contradicts the gospel. Mm -hmm. Here someone says Jesus is not the Christ, but if he lived a good life, he kissed babies, he patted dogs, he's going to get into heaven. It's a slippery anyway. slope here. Well, it is, because the moment you say it doesn't matter what you believe, it doesn't matter how you live, as long as you're sincere, you believe in a tree stump, you're going to make it to heaven, then Just why send missionaries? Why evangelize? As a matter of fact, why do any of it? Why bother with the clap trap of a religion? If I can go to heaven, Paul said, through my own life, then the Messiah died in vain, Galatians 2. Meaning, Jesus was on a fool's errand. If we can be saved through ignorance, well, we didn't know, mm -hmm. which is an excuse where Paul said there are no excuses, but the, the humanists will try to give excuses. Well, he didn't know. Well, he wasn't able. If we are capable of being saved, on the basis of what we think and what we do, then Jesus was a fool to come and die. Hmm. And if that, that was his argument. It would also follow then uh, that if a person's lack of knowledge over in the jungle, Uga Booga Man, uh, merits him a free ride into heaven, well then it would be a high disservice for the missionaries to go there in the yes, first place. Yes, and here in Second Thessalonians, Christ will take flaming vengeance on them that do not know God. Mm -hmm. So not knowing God is the basis of condemnation, not the basis of salvation. You're not getting to heaven because you don't know about Jesus. You're getting into heaven if you do know about Him and you accept Him as your Lord and Savior. So the heathen issue, usually I'm very comical to break up the, uh, the seriousness of the tone. They say, well, what about the heathen? I say, well, what about you? <laughs> And you see that I do that deliberately, not to be mean. It helps people to understand. Anyone who does not choose Jesus is a heathen. Or like someone says, well, what about the problem of evil? Why does God allow evil? I said, well, why does he allow you to exist? He should have blotted you out a long time ago. You should be a grease spot here in the concrete. God just sent a, a lightning bolt and evaporate you. He's giving you time to repent. So people want to discuss the heathen here, uh, the problem of evil in the stratosphere, abstract, bring it down. 
Why does God permit you, evil you, to exist? Because he's given you an opportunity to repent and believe and hear the gospel. And that's why God is bringing the gospel to every tribe, tongue, and nation. So this whole issue of free will oh. is so complicated because most people have some sort of fuzzy post-Renaissance Western U European psycho-babble concept. Do you think this idea of free will would naturally lead to a person thinking they have uh, such freedom that they can be free from sin altogether? Well, Yes, uh, the sinless perfectionism is due to a commitment to the idea that your will, supposedly you have one, mm -hmm. is free from God and free from yourself and neutral, then you can choose not to sin. Now, I challenge any Christian who is a biblical Christian, one, where in Scripture do we find any such... Sinless Go people. and sin no more. <laughs> when the Bible gives us the biographies of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, Paul, I don't care who, they're all sinners. There are no sinless people in the Bible except Jesus who knew no sin because he was God incarnate. Where are the sinless believers? There aren't any. Furthermore, all believers die. The wages of sin is what? Death. You're going to die. Now, I remember one guy who gave this sinless perfectionism, and see, this is where the Wesleys went wrong. They were committed to free will, therefore, you can be sinless, and they, the Wesleyan holiness or sinlessness. Mm -hmm. I remember this one professor at Columbia Bible College, Red Sanders, uh, said, I've lived two years without sin. Mm -hmm. So I raised my hand. And I said, may I talk with your wife? <laughs> Busted. He said, what? I said, can I talk with your wife? Because if you've been sinless, she will vouch for you. But no wife can live with the man who claims to be sinless and yet sins. He said, you're not allowed to talk to my wife. I said, yeah, we all know why. And everybody laughed at him. He became my enemy. I remember this one guy told me, I haven't sinned since I've been saved. Not one sin. So I stamped on his foot with the heel of my shoe. Now, I don't advise that to people, but I was a rambunctious young person. And he reared back to hit me, and I said, so you've sinned now. <laughs> a look of horror came on his face, and he ran away. He who says he's without sin is a liar, and he's making God out to be a liar. Sinless perfectionism is a conclusion from the premise that we are free from sin when we make our choices. But the scripture says, there is no man who lives and sinneth not. You know, John, uh, Romans 3, it says, for all have sinned. Mm -hmm. We understand the heiress some, somewhere in the past and are right now, a present part of said, we are right now falling short of the glory of God. All are right now, or James, in many things we all fail. And you see, sinless perfectionism, the arrogance of that, has led to the free willers using that as their final defense. Um, I'll never forget the acting dean, uh, Dean Hatch at Columbia Bible College, just before they threw me out. The free willers threw me out at Columbia Bible College for the sin of asking questions. And uh, he's another one who could choose not to sin. But uh, we got talking in his office, and he said, do you believe that God is sovereign over everything? I said, yes. Over evil? I said, yeah. 